asking him what was going on inside of him. He was just accepted as Tanner's quiet friend. Now, how do, the, how do children manage this disease so that, and children and young adults, young teens, manage this disease so others don't notice? How do they keep these voices, um, these feelings at bed? Well, they use different mechanisms to cope. They use video games, they use comic books, they use other kinds of fantasy, they use sports, or they use um, avoiding any situation where their parents will be asking, what is going on with you? And that's what Philip did. So what happened when Philip moved to Danvers? Well, psychosis, psychotic disorder in children and young adults is a progressive disease. It gets worse. And as time goes on, it gets worse. And stress can make it much worse. And what happens is that the child or young adult gradually loses the ability to maintain their grasp on reality. And that's when something happens and parents and teachers and everyone notice. So Philip was, Chisholm was under a lot of stress when he started at Danvers. He had lost his entire support system. He, had, he was away from his best friend. He had lost the Carter family. He had lost his soccer coach. He had lost all the support of a close-knit community in Clarksville, Tennessee. And he came to Danvers where he knew practically no one and had to start as a freshman in high school and deal with all the social, economic, economic, social, emotional demands of being a young teen starting high school. Now, in the days, in the short time he was at Danvers High School, there were signs. And what you'll hear is that when parents look back, when people around um, a child with psychotic disorder, a young teen with psychotic disorder, when they look back after the acute time, they realize there were signs, but they're subtle signs. And it's not unexpectedly, it was the fellow students at Danvers High School who noticed the signs in Philip that noticed the change in Philip. A few students noticed that <coughs> He had gone in that short time from being very friendly to being very quiet and alone. The day um, before the terrible events, uh, a member of the soccer team noticed that um, Philip was staring off into space and didn't respond when someone talked to him. Someone else noticed that he was emotionless and didn't celebrate when he got a goal. And on the day in question, there were several subtle but telling signs. During the school day, Philip, a good friend of Philip, one of his new friends, saw him and knew, saw, thought that he looked off and said, Philip, Philip, what's wrong? And Philip Chisholm didn't answer, he just walked away. He had never done anything like that before. In the class with Miss Gritzer, Philip, um, instead of paying attention to math, was listening to music through earphones and was drawing. And you'll hear that listening to music through earphones is a, a common way that people with psychosis, with psychotic disorder, cope with hearing voices. <laughs> and Miss Ritzer tried to redirect him to his work, but he continued to listen to the music and to draw. Afterwards, in the cla after class, in the classroom, you're going to hear from Autumn Cianci. And what Autumn observed was that Philip was not himself. She had known him somewhat, but he seemed very different that afternoon. And as Miss Ritzer was asking him questions at tennis about Tennessee and being appropriately friendly, Philip just got more and more tense. And Ms. Ritzer, in talking to him, 
tried to talk to him and he became tenser and tenser. At one point, he was, she was talking and he was looking out the, out the window and mumbling. Now, why didn't Philip Chisholm seem more crazy after he killed Colleen Ritzer? The, these periods of time when a child or a young adult are, over, is, are overwhelmed by um, psychosis and lose touch with reality do not necessarily act a long, last a long time. They can last a few hours or it, they can last a few weeks. And when it's over, the child return, or the young adult, young teen, returns to their baseline, how they were before, until there is another overwhelming episode. Now, Philip's actions after he killed Colleen Ritzer were not rational. You'll hear, you'll see video of him running in and out of the school for about an hour and a half after he killed Miss Ritzer. And um, while he's running around the school, he has a hood up, a hood down, a mask on, a mask off. Uh, his full face is exposed. He. Um, and, and there are cameras everywhere, all over the school. But he, he keeps changing um, how he looks. But often, his full face is exposed. After about an hour of this running around, he runs into the school with blood all over his pants, barefoot, and goes all the way up to the third floor, making no effort to hide his face or his condition. And then an hour and a half later, after leaving the school area, he, he doesn't flee Danvers, he goes and uses Miss Ritzer's credit cards, goes to the movies. And then where is he found? Just walking on Route 1 in the dark, aimlessly north. And how does he appear to the police? Very strange, very odd. He doesn't make eye contact. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to something that I'd ask you to pay attention to. It's a factual issue that will relate to your deliberations. And I'd ask you to pay attention to the sequence of events, including the time of Ms. Ritzer's death. Now, there are two more aspects of um, the evidence that you're going to hear at this trial that I'd like to bring to your attention. One is, in diagnosing a child or a young teen with a psychotic disorder, one of the things that doctors look at is whether there's a family history of severe mental illness. In Philip's case, there is. His maternal grandmother and his maternal aunt suffer, have suffered from psychosis on and off for years and have had many, many hospitalizations. The second thing is that recently Philip was diagnosed with a psychotic disorder at Worcester Recovery Center. There they put him on an antipsychotic medi medicine and after a few days on it, he agreed to see his mother who he hadn't seen since his arrest. It's gonna be really hard to listen to this case. It's gonna be challenging and heartbreaking. But the real work of this case is to figure out the terrible landscape of a young boy's mind in the months and days and weeks before this terrible event. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Would you your first witness, please? Thank you. I'm up for James Mandel. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, the court officer is going to pass out notebooks to you and I'll give you an instruction on, uh, 
on uh, notes once you've all got have the notebooks. Mr. Bill, you have yourself here. So would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the cause now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God? Yes. You may be seated. You might want to move away from that once again. Good morning, sir. Good morning. It's been a motion to sequester witnesses that I've allowed in the case. That means that until all the evidence is over, you can only be in the courtroom when you're testifying. You may not discuss your testimony with the other witnesses or allow them to discuss your testimony with you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've passed out notebooks to you in case you decide uh, to take notes in this case. If you uh, decide to take notes, I have a few instructions for you. First, um, the notes uh, that you take are not your memory. They're merely an aid to your memory. Uh, I suggest that if you take notes, you do so sparingly. If you have your, note, your nose in a notebook, you're going to miss the trial. Uh, you may find notes helpful to remember times, dates, locations, measurements, terms, and the like. The notes will be taken from you at the end of every court day, kept in a safe place, unavailable to anybody else, returned the next day, and destroyed at the end of the trial. Do not use your notes to convince your fellow jurors of what the facts are, since the notes are not your memory, but merely an aid to your memory. If you decide not to take notes, of course, then do not do so, keeping in mind my instruction. If you do so, don't let it interfere with your concentration and your ability to observe the witnesses. Ms. McDougall, please. Thank you. Good morning, sir. In a loud, clear voice, can you introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Jamie Mondalto. I'm a 911 dispatcher by the Damas Police. And if you could spell your first and last name, sir. First name is Jamie, J-A-M-I-E. Last name is Mondalto, M-O-N-D-A-L-T-O. Sir, how long have you been employed as a dispatcher for the Danvers Police? About 17 years. And are you a civilian or a sworn officer? I'm a civilian. And what are your duties and responsibilities as a dispatcher for the Danvers Police? I handle the incoming 911 calls and the business line calls, and I dispatch the cruises after I take the call. So can I ask you to just move this sure. a little and, and, and face the uh, jury a little more as yes. you speak so that they can see it? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mondalto, do you have a shift that you normally work? Yes, I work 5 at night to 1 in the morning. And about how many officers would be on duty at uh, for your particular shift? Uh, five officers. Uh, do you know about how big Danvers is? Uh, I am not sure. <laughs> okay. I never thought of that. Um, as part of your duties and responsibilities, do you have to communicate with um, neighboring towns, the police departments for neighboring towns? Yes. And what are the neighboring towns for Danvers? I have Middleton, Peabody, Topsfield, Salem, Beverly. Sir, so drawing your attention to October 22nd of 2013, were you working that regular 5 to 1 shift? Yes. And where is your, where are you located in the police station? Uh, right when you come in the front door, there's an officer at the front desk, and then there's a dispatch center behind the front desk. And from where you, does anyone else sit with you in the dispatch center normally? Yes, there are two dispatches on at a time. Okay. Now, don't sir. Don't talk in the courtroom. Wait, don't talk in the courtroom. There's no exceptions. If you want to talk, there's a whole world out there. I don't want to have to say it again. No talking in the courtroom. Sir, on the evening of October 22nd, did you receive um, a call regarding a Philip Chisholm? Yes. Do you know about what time you received the call? About 6.30 p.m. And who was the caller? Uh, I believe it was a Diana Chisholm, the mother. And what, just generally, what was the nature of her call? She wanted to report that her son was missing or overdue at home. And is that an unusual call for you to get? No, no. We get calls from parents that their children haven't come home and... and uh, so we have them come into the station and we ask them to bring a picture of their child and fill out a missing person report. And did you do that with um, Mrs. Chisholm? Yes. And did she um, provide you with a date of birth and a description for her son, Philip? Yes. What do you do with that information? Um, I put that information out to the officers on patrol so that they can start looking for the person. And I notify the officer at the front desk and the officer in charge and then we take that information for a juvenile and enter it as a missing person into the computer right away. And what effect, if you know, does it have to enter it into the computer? Who else can see it then? That way surrounding towns, if they come across the person, when they run the person through the computer, they can see that person is a missing person, that we are looking for that person. 
And in addition, sir, do you have, are there any um, malls either in the town of Danvers or right nearby? Yes, there's the Liberty Tree Mall in Danvers and the North Shore Mall. And based on your experience with missing teenagers, do you take any steps with respect to the two malls when you get a report of a missing teenager? Yes, yeah, I, I call them all security and I let them know who we're looking for. And um, does the, to the best of your knowledge, so do the Danvers police have a Twitter page and a Facebook page? Yes, and I notified uh, the sergeant on duty that we should have his picture put on the Facebook so that people could get that in social media and know that we have a missing person. And did you at any point that evening have occasion to see what was put up on Facebook or Twitter by the Danvers police? Yes. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, the first time w attorneys ask to approach the witness, they do so because they're approaching your evidence, since you're the only judges of the facts. I don't require that they do that other than the first time they approach each witness, but I do require it the first time out of respect for your role as the judges of the facts and them approaching your evidence. Uh, sir, could you please take a look at those four um, items and let me know if you recognize uh, those postings. Yes. Yeah, I recognize those as the uh, Facebook that they put out or the Twitter type of post them to the media. Is it in fact both Facebook and Twitter? Uh, I'm not sure. I believe it was, I believe it is both of them, yeah. Okay. Facebook and Twitter, I believe. I would ask if you to be marked at this time. You're marked for identification. Thank you. you're located in the police station can you see if someone's come into the station uh, yeah there's a window there yeah you can look through and see who's coming in through the front at some point did you become aware of that diana chisholm had actually reported to the station yeah i believe they said that she'd come in to sign the paperwork and what are you able to do as a result of the paperwork being signed uh well with the juvenile it's our the person's already entered and is missing so we have a, a section where we f literally file the, the paperwork, but that's about. It's really a formality with the juvenile, is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah. Okay. And <clears throat> over the course of the rest of the evening, let me ask you this. Did you leave at your regular time of 1 o'clock that night? Yes. Okay. Over the course of the next, say, four or five hours, um, did you continue to dispatch officers to various locations in Danvers? Yes. In addition to that, did you have occasion to call in additional officers? Yes, we, uh, we called, uh, I believe it was the state police, we let, I believe we let them know. Okay. 
you let this you call the state police and at some point did you have occasion to call in the next shift of officers ahead of time I believe officer frost called the next shift in that, that's the house officer at the front door desk I don't I don't recall calling in any other officer okay and did you have any involvement in calling in other personnel in addition to police officers um, that evening uh, I don't I don't believe I did that might have been my partner's uh, and you so, indicated there were two dispatchers yes. working. Is that fair to say? Okay. Um, I have nothing further, Your Honor, for this one. Any cross examination? All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Cromwell's next witness, please, Ms. McDougall. Ladies and gentlemen, we can take a recess at any time the jurors need it. If anyone needs a recess before 11 o'clock, just let us know. Otherwise, we'll take the morning recess at 11 o'clock. Officer, if you could stop right here, turn and face the clerk. So would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the cause now and hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. You may be seated. <clears throat> Good morning, sir. There's been no motion to suppress the witnesses in the case, so until all the evidence in the trial is over, you may only be in the court when you're testifying. You can't talk about your testimony with the other witnesses, so let them talk about the answer with you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. In a loud, clear voice, can you introduce yourself to the jury? Sure. Uh, my name is Lawrence Nestor. Um, I'm an employee of the town of Topsfield for the Topsfield Police Department. And, sir, could you spell your first and last names, please? Sure. It's L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E is the first name, and the last name is N-E-S-T-O-R. And, sir, in fact, do you have two different roles for the town of Topsfield? Yeah. Um, uh, prior to us uh, closing the, the dispatch center, I was an emergency center operator and a reserve patrolman for the town. And in your role, fair to say now Topsfield uses a regional 911 system? Yes. Back in October of 2013, did Topsfield, was Topsfield responsible for its own dispatch? It was. Yes. And you were one of the dispatchers at that time? Correct. Okay. What shift did you work in October of 2013? I was working on the 4 to 12 shift. 4 p.m. to 12 a.m.? 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. And how many officers are working for uh, the town of Topsfield during that time period? Uh, we had one person who worked the desk and you had two officers on the road. Where is the Topsfield Police Station located? It, it's on Boston Street, which is Route 1 in the town of Topsfield. Okay. And um, using the fairgrounds <laughs> as a landmark, yes. where is the police station located with respect to the fairgrounds? It's right across the street from the fairgrounds. Okay. And on the uh, night of October 22nd, were you aware of anything going on in the town nearby? Yeah, uh, within the dispatch center, we would monitor the, the radio traffic from the towns that are around us. Um, and we were, you know, heard Danvers was looking for a missing student for a better part of the night. And at some point, did you hear other personnel being dispatched to Danvers? I think it was about, a, must have been about just about a half hour before I left for the night, the uh, state police uh, CPAC unit was called into the woods behind the Danvers High School. And what concerns did that raise for you? Objection. Um, as it relates to uh, not the truth, but uh, the um, state of mind induced in the witness as to the testimony that will follow, I'll allow it. But does counsel need to be heard or do you have the reason in mind? I, I just knew my objection. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, information is not uh, offered for its truth, but as it relates to the state of mind uh, of the witness, what he had heard uh, for the questions that follow. Sir, what was your concern when you heard state police CPAC being dispatched to Danvers? Uh, it means that to us, it means that there's a there's a dead body that they have to deal with. And who did you who were you concerned that body was at that time? I believed it was the missing student from Danvers. When you left, um, got, did you get off right around midnight that night? I did. Uh, the other dispatcher came on at twelve, and I you know talked for maybe ten or fifteen minutes, and then I left at that point. And what route do you take home? Uh, I drive Route One South towards Danvers. Can you describe Route 1 in that area south of the police station for us? Sure. It's a, it's, it's a two-lane road. Uh, it's a 50-mile-an-hour mm -hmm. road. 
it's just long and straight. What's the lighting like? Uh, the, not very many street lights. There's no sidewalks or street lights. It's a, just a kind of a poorly lit section of road. And is it a business area, a residential area? Uh, from that stretch, it's primarily uh, woods, and there's a one farmhouse up on uh, on each side of Route 1 as you approach Danvers, so it's not populated. And how, about how far, if you know, from the Topsville Police Station, if you make your way down Route 1 south before you hit the Danvers line? I believe it's a little over two miles. Um, and as you were driving away from the police station, um, did something catch your attention? Yeah, it was uh, as I was... Uh, cresting the hill right as you leave the station I just uh, saw to my out of my out of my right side uh, I saw a, a black male walking along he was walking north on the southbound side of the highway and where was he with respect to the highway uh, he wasn't walking next to it he was off uh, there's a section of woods and stone wall he was off to the right next to the wall and what if anything did you do as a result of seeing that I actually, I, there's, it just looked out of place to me, so I, I just continued on. I went up over the hill, turned around, and came back. And as I came back, I just kind of glanced to my left, and I noticed that he was walking away from that one farmhouse, and he was continuing to walk along the, uh, the stone wall on the, oh, no, off the highway as he was going uh, northbound at that point. Okay. And what, if anything, did you do then? Uh, at that point, I called the station to let them know that uh, it just didn't look right. There was something out of place. There was a guy walking along the wood line along Route 1. And did you have any further involvement that night? Uh, no. I have nothing further for this witness, Your Honor. Ms. Regan, did you have cross-examination? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Now, you testified that you saw him... Um, walking by the farmhouse correct yeah it was close enough to the to the driveway where the the driveway comes down onto route one that i didn't realize if he was coming from the farmhouse or going to the farmhouse so that's when i turned around to come back and saw that he was walking beyond it but you did not see him coming to or fro from the farmhouse no not at all he was walking parallel to the road but some distance in yeah and so there's the there's route one the road yep. and then there's like a grassy kind of area yeah. and then is there a stone wall yeah there's it's a, like a i would call it like a wooded tree line and a stone wall runs along the route one and he was between that stone wall and the road but in um he was more towards the wall than route one if that's what you're asking but he wasn't on the other side of the wall from no one. no 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 further questions. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure thing. Call us next witness, please. Officer Neil Covey. Clerk. Sir, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the cause now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? I do. You may be seated. Awesome. Awesome. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you, sir. Have a seat. Make yourself comfortable if you could, please. Good morning, Good morning sir. Um, I've issued an order that witnesses only be in the courtroom when they're testifying until the evidence is over and that they not talk about their testimony with other witnesses so let other witnesses discuss their testimony with them. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. In a loud, clear voice, can you introduce yourself to the jury, please? Uh, Neil Hovey. And how do you spell your first and last names? Neil, N-E-A-L, Hovey, H-O-V-E-Y. And, sir, how are you employed? As a patrolman for the Topsville Police Department. How long have you been a patrolman for the town of Topsville? Twelve years, uh, part-time, five years full-time. And drawing your attention to October 22nd of 2013, were you scheduled to work that night? The, the midnight going into the 23rd, yes. Okay. Um, where were you earlier in the evening before you went into work? I was at home. And what city or town do you live in? Danvers. 
at some point did you become aware of something that was going on in your town, Danvers? Yes. And how did you become aware of it? When I arrived home, my daughter that attends Danvers High School said that, that she had seen on a social media site, a Facebook, uh, that there was a missing 14-year-old. And did she show you a picture? Or did you have occasion to see a picture at any time? No, I did not. In addition to the information you got from your daughter and social media, did you receive any other information at the house regarding a missing teenager? No description, just uh, she said what his name was. We also received a reverse 911 call uh, from the town of Danvers, notifying us that it, there was a missing 14 year old and could you check your property to see if you see anything of unusual nature. And did you do that? Yes, we turned on the spotlights in the backyard. Uh, we opened up the door, we took a quick glance out, and we didn't see anything. And at some point, when did you leave your house to go to work in Topsfield? I'm not sure exactly, uh, around 11.30, possibly. When you arrived at the station, let me ask you this, how many other officers were working with you that early morning of October 23rd? One other officer. And who was that? Officer Joseph D. D. Bernardo. When you arrived at the station, what, if anything, did you do to get ready for your shift? When I arrived, I had learned that uh, Danvers was on, uh, was extending their search, uh, which I believe to be the missing 14 road, uh, to the rail trail uh, heading towards Topsfield. And can you describe for us what the rail trail is? The rail trail is a, it's a public way. It's a stone dust platform. Uh, it's through the woods. Uh, there's, uh, there's only natural light. And what's its intended purpose? Uh, for people, for our walking pathway. Okay. And where does it extend, where does it cover? Uh, from, from Danvers, it goes into Wenham and then into Topsfield. So there is a end of the rail trail that is in Topsfield, is that fair to say? It goes through Topsfield and I believe it extends into Boxford. Okay. And um, based on what you heard about the extent of the search coming out of Danvers, what, if anything, did you intend to do when you started working that evening or early morning, I guess? Well, as a concerned parent, I have children my, of my own, um, and uh, the cruiser that I was assigned to has a thermal imaging camera uh, on it. So I decided prior to my shift that I would go out and in the area of the rail trail uh, in Topsfield, I would uh, check that area and see if I could identify anything. And did you ultimately end up doing that? No, I, I never made it out of the driveway. And why was that? I received a uh, phone uh, call on my cell phone uh, from the dispatcher of the 4 to 12 shift. And he had stated that CPAC uh, was, uh, was called. And what did that mean to you? To me, that meant that CPAC is usually uh, only called in as the detective division uh, by the state police assigned to the district attorney's office. Usually we call them in when there's a, uh, a death of another or a serious uh, crime is committed. And at that point, based on what you knew, what did you, what, which of those options did you unfortunately think it was? I, I had believed at that time that the search had ended, um, and I specifically said to the dispatcher, uh, I can't believe a 14-year-old's life would be that bad that he would kill himself. So that was sort of your working assumption at that time? Uh, at that time it was. And at that point, what did you go about doing in terms of working your shift? I turned around in the driveway. I went uh, back to the station, um, and we have housekeeping chores uh, that we did, and I, I started doing some of those chores uh, in the garage. Okay. At some point, were you dispatched to respond to something? Uh, yes, I was. And what was that? There was a report that there was a black male uh, walking uh, northbound on Route 1 uh, in the southbound lane. And is there any, um, anything of concern to you as a top to police officer about people walking on Route 1? There's always a concern. And can you explain that? Well, it's, a, uh, it's just a two-lane road, uh, not very well lit uh, in certain areas. Uh, there's no sidewalk in the majority of the roadway. Uh, the speed of the, of the vehicles. So uh, we consider it uh, not a safe place to walk. And what type of action do you typically take with respect to pedestrians on Route 1? We, uh, we encourage them uh, to either we'll give them a ride uh, off the roadway uh, or to find another, another path. Now, um, when you got that report, what did you do? 
I immediately um, got my cruiser um, and came out of the police station driveway and then turned right, now going southbound um, on Route 1. And do you know about what time this was that you got the call about someone walking on Route 1? I believe the dispatch time was around 12.28 in the morning, or 28 past the hour. So this probably goes without saying, but what was the lighting like out at 12.28 in the morning? It was dark. Um, and when you left the station, did you know where the, your fellow officer, Officer <clears throat> DiBernardo, was? He was with me at the station. In the same cruiser? No, in a different cruiser. We were in the garage together. Okay, okay. And typically, for a call like that, would you both respond? Yes. Okay. As you pulled out, you said you made a right onto Route 1, is that correct? Yes. And how far did you travel approximately? I would say approximately two-tenths of a mile. Okay. And why, what caused you to stop at that two-tenths of a mile mark? Well, as I was proceeding to the area, uh, of the dispatch area, uh, we confirmed the, the area, they said Boston Street near South, uh, near Salem Road. Um, when I was driving up the hill southbound, I at the last minute observed a, a black male uh, that was at an indentation of the guardrail, um, and it was at the last minute. And what did you It was too late to stop then, so I went a little beyond. I did a three-point turn, uh, and then I, I came back northbound in the northbound lane. What type of a vehicle were you operating, Officer Heavy? I was in a mocked police cruiser. Was it a um, sedan type or a larger vehicle? Uh, a Ford sedan. And when you came around, what did you have in terms of lights or any other um, notifications on your vehicle? Uh, my blue emergency lights. What was the purpose of that at that time? Why well, it stopped in the middle of the roadway um, so to alert any other motorists uh, and when I was exiting the motor vehicle for my own safety. If I just have a moment, Your Honor. Sure. May I approach the footnote? Sure. Showing you a photograph, Officer Hubby, do you recognize what that photograph depicts? Uh, yes, I do. Does that photograph depict the area of Route 1 where you first made contact with the male? Yes, it does. I would ask that be marked as the first exhibit, Your Honor. No objection. Thank you. 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 Thank you or alert each other as to uh, their uh, intentions in an area of inquiry. And they do that uh, to, to uh, be efficient. And uh, that's the only reason that that's going on. Thank you. Your Honor, um, with council's permission, I believe there's a map I would ask to display to see if the witness, um, who would help the witness and uh, assisting the jury. And this is, a, I use it as a chalk, you mean, as opposed to uh, an evidence? Correct. All right. All right. Uh, any check with that being used as a chalk? Okay, that may be, uh, that may be yours. And, um, sir, are you familiar, you've indicated you live in Danvers. You're familiar with these various locations in the town of Danvers, is that correct? That is correct. And I think you have a screen in front of you, if that would be easier for you. Um, I, I could not see that from before, so. And um, drawing your attention to the star on the map, at the, so you would agree with me that the, all of the areas depicted in the red outline are the town of Danvers, correct? Yes. And then there's a star uh, to the north of that um, that appears to go over a river. Do you recognize that location? Uh, I think that is Route 1 in the Aeneas. If that, if I tell you the white line is Route 1 and the blue line is the Ipswich River, does that help orient you? Yes. Okay. And is that star essentially depict where you um, made contact with the male? Yes. And if we can now display the photograph that was just marked as Exhibit 1. Mm. And sir, you, um, I'm going to give you a pointer and you may need, with the court's permission, to step down 
because I'll tell you right now, it will not work on the one behind you, but it will work on that one. Um, and it's the green button. Um, if you, and you may be able to do it from where you are. Could you just indicate for the jury where you first made contact with the male on the side of Route 1? Step down so you can do oh, I think my fault. The thing is, turn it on. Okay. <laughs> That's why I have helpers. Is it on? Mm -hmm. yeah. So my uh, my Mukanta was right in that area. Right in that area. And there's, correct me if I'm wrong, there's sort of a barrier, is that a bridge? Yeah, there's a barrier on both sides. It's a bridge that goes over the Ipswich River. So was it just at the sort of beginning of the barrier or the bridge that you first made contact? It was a little, uh, it was maybe a little closer to halfway, but not quite halfway. Okay, okay. Thank you. The um, exhibit can come down. And can you mark the uh, chalk right Still on. Um, we we yeah. have to do it right now, if you don't need but at some point, the chalk will uh, mark for identification. Yes. Okay. Officer Hovey, um, I think I got a little bit ahead of us, but you indicated you did a three-point turn and you pulled over. What did the male do when you pulled over? When I pulled over, he stopped as well. Okay. And um, he's now on the other side of the highway from you? Yeah, that is correct. Two-lane highway, though it may Two be. Two-lane, <laughs> yes. He's in the south lane. I'm in the north northbound. Okay. And did you get out of your cruiser? Yes, I did. Where did you go? I, when it was safe, I crossed the across the street to the southbound lane. Can I ask you if you could project your voice up uh, louder, if you could, please, officer? Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. As you approached the male, were you able to see what he was wearing? As I approached, yes. What did what was he wearing? He had a turquoise full zippered hooded sweatshirt, uh, a black shirt, black shorts, uh, knee high length socks. He had um, blue uh, Adidas sneakers with a greenish yellowish uh, stripe on the sneakers. And he also had a uh, red and black nylon backpack, sort of a satchel, pull string backpack. At that point, could you see whether there was anything around his neck? Uh, around his neck, when I got closer, I could see that was pulled down. There was a clump of clothing uh, that we learned to be a uh, a ski mask. And what was the temperature like, um, if you recall, that evening? It was cool. I believe uh, it was 47 degrees. And when you approached the male, in what direction was he looking? He was facing northbound. Look, continuing to look up Route 1? Yes essentially looking the point of view of the person who took that picture that is correct okay and were you where were you with respect to him where did you position yourself uh to his right side so you're essentially talking to his right shoulder and his profile is that fair to say yes about you know four or five feet away from him and what if any communication did you have with him at that time <coughs> i asked him where he was going and what did he tell you he said nowhere and what else did you ask him? I then asked him where he was coming from, and he stated Tennessee. And based on the condition of his clothing, did it appear to you he'd been out for a long time? No, it did not. What other further questions did you ask him at that time? I again asked him, because those were not typical responses, uh, I again asked him where he was going, and he again stated nowhere. And what was the lighting like in the area where you were making contact with this male at this time? It was dark. Were you able to see his face? I was able to see, yes, I was. Let me ask you this, sir. The person that you made contact with on the side of Route 1 that early morning, do you see that person in the courtroom? Yes, I do. Could you please point him out and describe something he's wearing? He has a black uh, jacket on, he has glasses on, a white shirt, and a tie. May the record reflect identification of the defendant? With no objection, it may. Now, <clears throat> sir, at some point had Officer DiBernardo arrived? Yes. And um, did he join in your conversation with the defendant? Uh, yes, he did.
can you just describe what any further conversation you had with the defendant first, specifically yourself? I asked him uh, where he uh, where he lived, and he stated he has no address. Did you ask him anything at that time about who he was? I asked him if he had an ID on him. And what did he tell you? No. Um, did um, in your earshot, Officer Di Bernardo ask him anything? He, uh, when Officer Di Bernardo arrived, he asked him to take his hands out of his uh, pockets. And which pockets were his hands in? In his uh, sweatshirt pocket. Okay. And did uh, the defendant respond? Yes, he did. Meaning he took his hands out of his pockets? Yes. Okay. And did Officer Di Bernardo ask him anything else? He asked him um, what was in the backpack. How did the back, how big of a backpack was it, meaning how full? Uh, it, had, it, it was full in nature. Okay. And what did the defendant say when Officer Di Bernardo asked him what was in the backpack? He said his survival gear. Um, at, some, at that point, sir, what did you do with respect to the defendant? At that point, my partner uh, took the backpack from, um, from the party. Okay. And did you do anything ultimately with respect to the defendant's person? After that, we, um, because of the dark natures of the road, we escorted him across the street to a safer location for us between the two police cruisers. Okay. And what was safer about that location between the two police cruisers? Well, we had the emergency lighting with the protection of, of the you know, police cars. Okay. And what, if anything, did you do with respect to the defendant when you reached the other side of the road? We had him stand um, at the trunk of the first police cruiser, my police cruiser, between the two cars. Okay. At the trunk of your cruiser before the hood of Officer Di Bernardo's cruiser? Yes. Okay. And what happened next? At that time, I asked him to remove the contents from his pockets and put them on the trunk of my cruiser. And did he do that? Yes, he did. And when you say pockets, which pockets are we talking about? The, uh, his, the pockets of his shorts. And had you, um, did you, how did you know that there was anything in the pockets of his shorts? On the other side of the street, I did a pat frisk uh, of his front left and right pockets. And can you just explain to the jury what a pat frisk is? A pat frisk is that we look for dangerous weapons uh, for an area that we can't visibly see because of either clothing obstructions or uh, lighting. And it was extremely dark that evening. So, what so we you... just gently touched the area. Okay. And what had you felt when you touched the area of the defendant's short pockets? In the left uh, front pocket, uh, it was a hard plastic, um, similar to an identification card uh, or a credit card. It was a hard piece of plastic. And in the other pocket, what did you feel? It was a oblong object hard oblong object in the right pocket. And ultimately when the defendant took the things out of his pocket on the hood of your, on the hood of Officer Di Bernardo's cruiser rather, what did those objects prove to be? The, what was the hard, hard plastic objects? Uh, there was two Massachusetts driver's licenses, uh, there was credit cards, uh, and there was an insurance card. And the other pocket was the hard oblong object uh, turned out to be a rock. I could just have one moment. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Members of the jury, in addition to uh, keeping in mind, letting me know at any point that you need a recess and feeling free to stand during the testimony at any point over there, I'd also uh, ask you to. Uh, let us know, raise your hand, just let us know if you're having <coughs> difficulty hearing anything. It's important that you hear every bit of the testimony. Officer Hubby, handing you some items, do you recognize those items? Yes, I do. And what do you recognize those items to be? It was the uh, two Massachusetts, Massachusetts driver's licenses and the credit cards and the insurance cards. And are those the cards and identifications that you found in the defendant's pocket the early morning of October 23rd? Yes, it is. And whose uh, 
Massachusetts identification and driver's license are those? Colleen Ritzer. At that time, sir, did that name have any meaning to you? No, it did not. I would ask these be marked as the next exhibit, Your Honor. Any When those items came out of the defendant's pocket, what, if anything, did you or Officer DiBernardo ask him? After I examined the IDs, uh, I looked at um, the party and I asked him, what is your name? And what did he tell you? Philip Chisholm. And did that name have any significance to you? Yes, it did. How did you recognize that name? By what my daughter had told me before uh, I left for work. You knew that to be the missing teen out of Danvers? That is correct. Did that knowledge in any way change the encounter you were having with the defendant? Well, I went from concern for my own safety uh, to a almost a parent mode where I, I really couldn't believe, I was in disbelief that I had found the missing 14-year-old and that I was able to bring a 14-year-old home safely to his parents. And what steps did you take in order to go about making that happen at that time? Uh, at that time, uh, we asked him a few more questions, but then we, uh, we, my partner said to him, why don't you get warm and uh, sit in the back seat of the cruiser and we're gonna bring you to the police station. And when you say you asked a few more questions, what were those questions about? We asked him where he got uh, these uh, identifications. And what did he tell you? He stated he found them. Did one of you ask him further questions about that? Uh, we both did. I asked him uh, where he found them, and he stated stop and shop. Do you know where the closest stop and shop is to where you stopped him? It's in Danvers, about three miles away. And was there any further questioning about that? My partner asked him which stop and shop, and he said, I, didn't, I do not know. And now, sir, I'm handing you another item. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what do you recognize that as? This was the rock that was in his right pocket. So identifications and credit cards in the left pocket and rock in the right pocket? That is correct. I would ask that be Martin is the next Good. 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 Three, so Martin. Officer Hovey, after the conversation about the identifications coming from Stop and Shop, was there any further conversation with the defendant at the roadside? I asked him, where, again, where he got these, and he said, from her car. And was there further questioning? Counter. And you've indicated, I think, that there's a plexiglass between that counter and the bench. That is correct. And what did you have with you? I had the, uh, the backpack and the uh, contents from his pockets. Okay. And what, if anything, did you do with respect to his backpack at that time? I put him on, on the counter. Put it on the counter? Yes. Okay. Where, where it was on the counter, was it visible to the defendant through the plexi box? Yes. And did you have any conversation with him about his backpack at that time? I asked him if there's anything dangerous uh, in the backpack that would ca cause harm to myself. And is that a routine question you ask before inventorying anything? Yes, it is. And what, if anything, did the defendant respond? He stated yes. Now, you had indicated that on the side of the road, the defendant was not making eye contact with you. Is that correct? That is correct. In the station, where was he looking? Looking straight ahead. Okay. Um, but he indicated yes, there was something in the backpack. Is that correct? Yes. What, if anything, did you do at that time? I grew a little more concerned about what was dangerous about it. I put on a pair of gloves, and then it was a sh like a pull string, so I started inching it uh, open so I could see the inside of the, the contents. And when you say a drawstring, is it like the kind of backpack you get for running a race, or you get as a, um, I can't think of the word, but like a favor for running a race or something? A yes, street. it was a nylon satchel, it, yes. Okay. And as you opened it, what was the first item that you were able to see and retrieve? A white wallet. And um, what kind of a wallet was it? More of a purse 
type on white wallet. Did it appear female? I'm not asking you the brand. I promise. Did it appear female? Did uh, female, female wallet? yes. Okay. And um, did you notice anything about the condition of the wallet? Uh, nothing out of the ordinary. What, if anything, did you do at that time with respect to the wallet? I placed that on the counter. Okay. What was the next thing that you did? Uh, there was a multicolored, actually Vera Bradley. Um, soft zipped case uh, that I removed. Then there was a uh, white, a uh, blue with white stripe Nike uh, a, um, a shirt, athletic shirt that was specifically sized large. It said 14 to 16 on it. There was a sheer underwear in the color of uh, like bluish greenish uh, color. There was what uh, two. Camelback water bottles, a set of keys. There was uh, two rolls of two-inch tape, uh, one roll being black and white, um, the other roll being red and like a duct tape, um, you know, similar to a duct tape. There was a set of keys. There was a white towel. There was a flashlight that was orange and black. There was um, a what I would consider a scuba diving knife uh, that was in a sheath. Was it in um, any kind of packaging? No, it was a, like it goes around your waist, so it had a sheath and the knife was in, inside the sheath. And as you removed each of these items from the bag, where did you place them? Placed them on the counter. And once, um, and were there other sort of miscellaneous items in the bag as well? It was, yes, there was. What kinds of things were they? Miscellaneous uh, papers and other contents. And once the bag was emptied, what did you do next? Uh, at that time, I opened up um, the white purse, the white that, wallet. That first item you had removed? Yes. And when you opened that, what did you observe? I observed a box cutter, an aluminum steel um, colored traditional box cutter. And what, if anything, did you notice about the condition of the box cutter? Uh, that the blade was still protruding out and it had a reddish, uh, brownish colored substance uh, on, the, on the box cutter. And as you observed that, what, if anything, did you do? Then I asked him, uh, whose blood is, is this? And when, you, okay. and when you say you asked him, who did you ask? I asked the defendant. And how did he respond? He said, it's the girls. Okay. Sure. So, had you picked it up or done anything to display it to him at that time? No, I had the wallet in my hand and the box cutter was in the wallet. Okay. And after he said it's the girls, what if anything did you do? We stopped everything. And did you remain in the room at that time? At that time, my partner uh, read him his Miranda rights. And where did you go? I stayed there uh, for that process. And once that process was complete, what did you do? Then I left the room and went into the dispatch area. And, and what was your purpose in doing that? Uh, to call Danvers police and tell them what we had found. Um, and at some point, how about how long were you in the other room um, communicating with dispatch? Uh, two or three minutes. When you returned to the um, to the room, did you have an opportunity to make any further observations of the defendant's person or the condition of his clothing? Uh, my partner uh, brought to my attention uh, two pieces of clothing. And what were those two pieces of clothing? The, uh, the jacket that he was wearing, the sweatshirt that he was wearing, and the sneakers. And what did you notice about the jacket and the sneaker, or the sweatshirt and the sneakers? At that time, my partner had taken those uh, two objects away from the uh, defendant uh, and then he pointed out to me the uh, similar brown reddish stains that were on the jacket and also the same similar stains on the, on the sneakers. And when you say similar, do you mean similar to those on the box cutter? Yes.
showing you an item, Officer Hubby, do you recognize that item? Yes, I do. And I'm going to suggest you use the gloves to handle it, but you're, I'm going to tell you, I could barely get them on my hands. You might not be able to, but if you want to just use them. Uh -uh. If you could just um, hold that up and let us know how you recognize it. Oh, wait, I think we have bigger ones. <laughs> this was the backpack that he was wearing. Um, and that's the backpack he was wearing when you first encountered him on Route 1 and then you inventoried at the station, is that correct? That is correct. And is that in essentially the same condition it was in when you saw it on the night of, or the early morning of October 23rd? Yes, it is. I'd ask this to be marked at the next exhibit, Your Honor. Good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once this uh, exhibit is marked, we're going to... Uh, excuse you for the morning recess and I'll just uh, speak to counsel for a moment after the jurors excuse uh, okay uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury we're going to take a uh, recess uh, we're going to hope that we uh, can have you back in the courtroom no um, later than 11 um, 20 uh, if you need more time take the time you need if you're ready or earlier than that let the court officers know don't discuss the case in any way even if it seems the most innocuous minor matter don't discuss anything about um, the courtroom during the recess. And the first thing I'll do when you come out is to make sure you follow those instructions. Jurors are excused. Could remain in session. All right.